book, Homecoming. So we're going to give just a few minutes to get everyone on. We know there's a lot of interest, so welcome, and we will start our conversation in just a minute or two. But to make sure you know you're at the right place, it's the American Economic Liberty Project's book club. We are going to be discussing with Rana Faruhar, her new book, Homecoming, which I recommend everyone go get. It's actually totally readable, and um, it covers a lot of the issues around globalization, corporate power, the failure of the current model, and what could happen next, but it's not boring. And as someone who spent a lot of time trying to unpack this stuff, this is an eminently readable version of the stuff you got to need to know. So um, small pitch there for the book, which certainly I'll repeat. I think we are basically, we have a bunch of people who are with us, and I think I may actually now start with an introduction of Rana, our guest. But first, American Economic Liberties Project has this series, Thinking Big, where we take cutting edge authors and we're honored to have them come join us in a conversation about a new book that they have written. And um, this particular book basically covers all of the issues that are affecting most of the underlying goals and themes we're seeing playing out in the election that's gonna happen in the next 10 days. So um, just to start with an introduction of Rana, she is now the global business columnist and an associate editor of the Financial Times. She's based in New York. She's also CNN's global economic analyst. You've probably seen some of her other books, one of them, Makers and Takers, The Rise of Finance and the Fall of American Business, was about why capital markets are no longer actually supporting business <laughs> and is a little bit of an appetizer to the situation that her new book, Homecoming, starts with in providing a snapshot of the mess we're currently in. Before Rana joined the FT and CNN, she spent many years as a reporter and a foreign affairs editor and correspondent on economics for Time, for Newsweek. Um, she is one of those reporters who not just is extremely intense in her interviewing, but she's very well read. She talks to the actual people, but she does the homework. And so you can see that in this book. And again, the book, Homecoming, The Path to Prosperity in a Post-Global World, the beginning of it describes the mess we're in. And that is actually, Rana, welcome. So Thank glad to you. Here. Thanks, Lori. And thanks for that incredibly generous introduction that I feel like my mother wrote. <laughs> Well, as somebody who spent a lot of time trying to boil down these issues into something that's accessible and broadly understandable, kudos, because oh. you, you did it. And I have <laughs> um, so folks, seriously, this book, I mean, this is, if you really want to get sort of the boilerplate, and also if you need like a severe antidote to everything Tom Friedman has ever written in his life, with all of the facts and the footnotes to basically <laughs> go with the discussions and not a lot of descriptions of dinner with famous people, <laughs> then I recommend highly this book. And I'm going to start out with Rana telling us a little bit about what she found, which is basically she found the wreckage, the damage, the ruin. And I'm, you know, I'm making fun of Tom Friedman because this is a very, very somber and actually incredibly depressing. And her book is honest about it situation of what 30 years of the so-called neoliberal model has has wrought. So tell us, just start with sort of where your book starts and describing yeah. the mess. Well, thank you for that. Um, it's funny, I'm actually allergic to dinner with famous people. <laughs> I don't know how I got to work at the FT actually given that, but um, uh, I guess I started in some ways this book um, with a felt experience of what neoliberal economic policy has done to a lot of the country. Um, so as you kindly mentioned, you know, I've worked for a lot of global publications. I was a foreign correspondent for about half my career and kind of came up at a time where questioning the neoliberal paradigm. And, and by that, just to unpack that, you know, word, which is used in a lot of different ways, this idea that capital goods people were all going to kind of seamlessly travel across borders. And most importantly, that they were going to land where it was best and most productive and that was going to be great for everybody all the time. Um, I grew up in rural Indiana 
Um, and my childhood was punctuated by my friends in high school um, losing their family farms through consolidation of massive agricultural firms. Um, some of those families went to work um, in factories, but the factories were also being hollowed out from the 90s onward um, because of neoliberal trade policy, um, outsourcing to you know, the cheapest labor spots. Um, and, and so I, I kind of knew in my gut that there was something wrong with the conventional economic wisdom. And as I traveled through the circles that I was traveling in and I began to see the decisions that were being made, it also became clear to me, and this was kind of the topic of my first book, that gosh, all of our companies are, or many of our companies, most of the big ones are making these really short-term decisions that are actually terrible not only competitively in the global marketplace, when you think about countries like China that are competing for the 50 year horizon, not the quarter, but even relative to their own future interests in three years, five years. And it's just like, why, what, you know, what's going on? And maybe I'll kind of encapsulate the book uh, thesis by sharing a conversation that I had that is in the intro of the book. Cause it was just one of those conversations that you have sometimes as a journalist that stick in your head for years. I had actually gone to see um, Richard Trumpka, the late leader of the AF. I know, right? I mean, ama amazing man. Talk about a reader, by the way. I mean, like his office was stacked and he had read all the books. Um, former, you know, before he became a labor leader lawyer, he had been a coal miner in Pennsylvania, um, lived the sort of brutality of anti union sentiment consolidation. Um, anyway, I, I wanted to understand that for, in, for my first book, actually, some of the short termism and, and also why labor wasn't valued. You know, I mean, I had actually grown up in factories. My dad ran factories. He was an engineer. He was a plant manager. And then he later started his own small manufacturing business. And so it was always very clear to me that the workers on the line and labor in general actually had a lot to offer. And in fact, um, and this is something that really uh, was pounded home when I was a foreign correspondent in Europe, that that, that methodology of management and labor working together was important. So anyway, I go to interview Rich and I'm like, you know, what was going on in the 90s? Like, why were we doing what we were doing? Why are we cutting these trade deals in this way? What was the conversation that you were having around NAFTA, around the accession of China into the WTO, which happened in 2001? And he said, well, you know, I remember... Um, a policy person from the Clinton administration coming and having a chat with me about this. And he said, you know, look, I know that this is going to be tough for labor, but, but don't worry, it's going to get better. You know, it's going to be a huge hit, but then eventually wages are going to level out that leveling out, leveling up, whatever you call it, you know, that's supposed to happen globally. And then, and then it's going to be fine. In the meantime, we're all going to get cheaper TVs and, you know, prices are going to go down. It's going to, it's all going to be good. And Trumpka said, he said, um, well, how long is that leveling out going to take? And the policymaker said with a straight face, three to five generations. And that was my hometown, is my hometown, um, which went 76% Trump um, for reasons I actually, even though I'm a registered Democrat, completely understand um, this sense of... Um, both parties amongst working people, a sense that both parties were somehow beholden to policies, not just in trade, but in finance, um, in, in kind of economic policy in general, that were good for the global economy as a whole, but weren't necessarily working at the nation state level. And so what I did in this book was kind of go back and start dissecting that in two ways. Um, I looked at it from a big picture standpoint you know, what really happened from the 80s onward? And, you know, in the 80s, of course, you saw the Reagan Thatcher revolution, you saw the unleashing of global capital, you saw big companies going abroad, big companies getting bigger. But then by the 90s, you saw the unleashing of global trade. And that happened not under the Republicans, but under Democrats. And then I think you really started to have that witch's brew of, gosh, what is the party for working Americans? What is the politics and the economics for working Americans? And so, um, I think that that's where we are now. I think that the fact that the global economy has run so far ahead of national politics, not just in this country, but in many countries, is the reason for the kind of polarization that we have. It's the reason for um, the fact that we can't get anything done right now, or very little done in Washington. 
And so, so I looked at that and then I, and we can, I'll stop now, but I, I also wanted to kind of report the stories on the ground of people living this. And also to be fair, to report the good news, because I actually think that we will get to a better place out of this bumpy period. The world is not flat, you know, sorry, Tom. Um, it's bumpy, but we're going to get to a better place, but we have to figure out the right, um, the right way to get there. And I looked at that through food, uh, textiles and technology. And I'm, I want you to talk in, in, in some detail about that vision, the optimistic vision for because it's a different take on what comes next. And I think a lot of people have come to, and it's a much happier place where I'd like to live than where some people think we're going. But before, before you get there, because you've done a really good reporting job of exactly that, which is practically unpacking what has been the actual lived experience. Like why in your hometown in Indiana, in my hometown in Wausau, Wisconsin, small, you know, medium-sized town, used to have lots of manufacturing, central Wisconsin, there has been, you know, just a wipeout of generations of people who had, you know, a job where one person worked, a lot of union jobs. They had a middle-class life with a fishing boat and a cottage and, yeah. you know, and they have the, that could be achieved with one person working full-time. And now it's, you know, it's a much different place and the politics also reflect it. So what do you think are sort of the, you know, four or five most shocking and compelling things, if it were a speed round that this regime has done that people can sort of identify with and go, oh, that, that like deaths of despair, which to me yeah. is, my number one. What are yeah. your five or four or six? Gosh, that's a great, that's a great question. Well, you know, deaths of despair are really the result um, of these policies. As we know, that's been well documented. I would maybe pull back and say, okay, what was the model predicated on? And, and what did those things end up doing in the real world? And I would say that the last 40, 50 years of globalization, neoliberal globalization has been predicated on three things. Um, cheap capital, and in particular, really, really low interest rates declining over, you know, roughly 40 years until quite recently. And again, this is what I explored in my first book that didn't encourage the right things um, because of some of the policy tweaks that were made. So if you look at, um, you know, in the 1980s, things like stock buybacks become legal again. They used to be considered market manipulation, this idea of a company going out and buying up all their shares in the open market and artificially jacking up the price. That becomes legal. Then in the Clinton administration, you start to see those um, stock shares compensation being tax preference. So basically you get Silicon Valley and then the rest of the country offering 80% of corporate pay in, in stock. So, hmm, is it any wonder then that um, companies basically want to raise their share prices and, you know, they'll do anything to do that? Well, what that meant, just, you know, this is one real world aspect, is that they stopped building things in America. Anything that you had to invest in, a, a new factory, um, worker training, um, you know, R&D, even basic R&D became something that you were actually penalized for in the marketplace. So there's this tremendous hollowing out of the American company. Um, so that's point number one. The other thing that our model was predicated on was cheap labor. And that was mostly coming from Asia and in particular from China. So a lot of those companies were essentially doing what, you know, Harvard Finance MBA 101 would tell you to do, which is get your costs off the balance sheet, treat um, labor as an expense, not a resource and just outsource, outsource, outsource. And one ramification I always think of because it's just so stark um, is the Rana Plaza factory collapse, um, which happened, I could name 10 things like this, but that was that um, horrible incident where you had big brands like Walmart and H&M outsourcing, outsourcing, outsourcing. You know, there's, there's maybe 10 or 12 links in that supply chain pretty soon the risk starts to disappear, almost like the risk disappeared in those subprime mortgages. They've been spliced and diced so many times. It's very similar. And then, you know, at some point there's an outsourcer that has completely terrible standards and you get a shoddy building. Um, there's a fire, it collapses and 1100 people die. You know, that's a real world consequence. And that's not even in the U S you know, um, meanwhile, in the U.S., uh, the folks that were told that cheaper TVs were going to make everything better were struggling with 
the fact that housing, healthcare, education, all the things that really make us middle class were rising at three times the price of the core inflation rate, even before the latest round of, of inflation. So another real world example. Um, final thing I would mention that the mo old model was predicated on was cheap energy. And um, that's something that's really hitting Europe right now. Obviously, you know, Germany's realized, hey, not such a great idea to get all your gas from an autocrat, from a crazy autocrat. <laughs> I mean, like, I, I have to say, I'm like, you know, I was just talking about this before we went on air with Matt, that the willful blindness of Europe in this respect, and in particular of Germany, has just been, it's, it's crazy making to me. You know, I was writing years ago, maybe not such a great idea to spend all this money on this pipeline and assume that everything's going to be okay with Russia indefinitely. It was just, it was such a representation of the thinking of the neoliberal era, which is that everything's going to be okay all the time. And the model works as long as that's true, but then it stops working when it isn't. And it wasn't pretty quickly. And actually, before you jump in, Matt, I realized I was so excited to get to Rana and hear what she had to say. I didn't introduce you or me. So I'm- oh my God, I know. And you guys are like the actual real experts. By the way, people, these are the two I speak to to figure out what's going on. So- well, That's very kind. I'm Lori Wallach and I'm the director of AELP's Rethink Trade Project. And Matt Stoller is the research director of AELP. And, is in, and, and isn't that league actually that rare league of Rana's as far as incredibly smart, incredibly well-read and very articulate. So we promise we're not going to be boring. And Matt, dive in before I ask Rana to talk about what her vision is of the future. Yeah, no, I, I so I, I, it's an optimistic book. Right, that's what's, you know, like it's easy to talk about problems. We like to talk about yeah, problems yeah. for policy. You know, Lori and I are policy advocates. And so you see a problem, you want to fix it. But this is an optimistic book, right? This is about like a world after globalization and why it's better and different and weirder. So like, what what does that world look like? I mean, I think Lori, I'm kind of stealing your question a little bit, but I want to like, yeah. you know, how do you make an optimistic case right now? I mean, it doesn't seem like a particularly optimistic moment. That was precisely you know, it's, my question. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. Well, we're all in agreement then. I'm, and by the way, uh, Matt, I'm so glad you pivoted to optimism. Uh, <laughs> that's, I find that that's a big selling point right now. Um, it's actually incredibly easy to make the case. And, and let me kind of lay out why. So let's put aside the really contentious geopolitics of the moment, which are their own thing. And we can talk about that and dig into that more. But I've been covering global business for 32 years in three different continents. I would say 10, even 15 years ago, I was starting to see um, a, a recalculation on the part of certain companies about long, complex global supply chains. So particularly in areas like um, low margin goods, um, textiles, furniture, um, you know, certain kinds of things that are just cheap. And maybe you don't want to spend all that time and energy toting them from the South China Seas all the way back to the US. That was a that was a calculation that companies were starting to make. And, and it had to do with the fact that wages were rising in Asia, but productivity levels were nowhere near what they were in the US or many parts of the West. And so I remember when years ago, when I was at Time Magazine, I did a cover story actually called Go Glocal. It was, I mean, that's kind of one of those horrible hybrid <laughs> words that I don't even want to own, but they- Yeah, they you should be ashamed of that cover. one. I that's should be ashamed. Thing. And I did not make it into this, but isn't homecoming so so much warmer? Um, well, yeah, Glocal. And <laughs> I went out, I went out to see Caterpillar actually uh, in the Midwest and they were actually starting to move more rapid prototyping and production to regional and local firms because they, what they were finding was that it was just taking too long, it was too complicated, it was too fraught, and they were not able to iterate and innovate as quickly if they were essentially sending a lot of things off to you know China and then waiting for them to come back six months later and there's problems and the quality's not as good. And so it was fascinating. That was already happening. Now you see someone like Elon Musk, like him or not, taking that to the nth level and saying, okay, I'm going to make 
the Tesla and I want to, and this is a, this is a product that I need to innovate. I need to iterate very quickly. I want everything to be local. I want all my supply chain to be in my control or as much of my supply chain to be in my control as possible. And it's almost like going back to an older era. It's the River Rouge model, you know, um, uh, of Detroit, where you control all, you control the energy, you control the inputs, um, you know, the, the workers are on the ground, the parts are being made in one place. And there are costs to that, but if there is scale and if there is kind of a floor under purchasing, there's also tremendous productivity gains and efficiencies to be gotten that way. And now it's called, vert to get wonky, but it's probably a wonky crowd. Um, uh, it's called vertical integration and it is the new thing in um, corporate America. Everybody wants to own their supply chain. And, and interestingly, the companies that came out of COVID the best were the ones that could. So that's that's one point. I could keep going on, but let me well, stop. I want to ask about whiny Europeans for a second. Um, oh, sure. I'd love because, to talk about those. Because, so Macron was talking about how, oh, we need a Buy European Act, which is similar to the Buy American Act. Yeah. And you know, part of what Biden was doing with Inflation Reduction Act and also Trump before him with tariffs was trying to induce more manufacturing here. And the Europeans, one of the points of your book is that this change is global. So everybody's trying to make yes. things more locally um, and that that's fundamentally a good thing. Yeah. Um, and, and the Europeans have been talking about this. The Chinese obviously want to make things there um, for different, slightly different reasons. But, you know, Macron, at the same time as the, the, the French are saying we want to and the Europeans are saying we want to make things in Europe, they're also bitterly complaining. And the South Koreans are bitterly complaining about the U.S. actually trying to relocalize supply chains. Yeah. And I wonder, like, can you talk a little bit about the geopolitics there? Because it seems crazy to me that like like these com these countries are not seeing the kind of both the ne necessity to do that but also yeah. how you the US American society is kind of slowly collapsing and that it's better to have some sort of coherent American society than for them to like be able to make a few more batteries or whatever it is um yes I would agree with all that <laughs> let me take that in two parts and um I'll start with the reason regionalization actually makes sense, and then I'll move to whiny Europeans. Um, regionalization <laughs> makes sense for all kinds of reasons. Um, once you put a price, a real price on a product, when you, when you put not just the cheapest way you can have it made, let's take a mask. I'm going to take a, an actual real world example, and this is in fact in my book. Um, during quote, COVID, I spent some time in a textile supply chain in the Carolinas. And it's really interesting, super interesting, almost like a Darwinian case study of what happens when China comes into the WTO. You get an industry that, as Lori knows better than anybody, is hollowed out almost overnight, like 90% of production goes to Asia. But what's left is amazingly nimble. Um, so there's, there's these handful of family-owned mid-market businesses. Crucially, almost all of them are private, so they don't have the, the pressure from the market. They don't have that short-termism. And they're working, again, in a somewhat Germanic kind of collaborative, competitive environment where, let's say a big order comes in, one guy can't do it. They call the two guys down the street. They work together. So there's this kind of community, lo a localism that is that is operating that's that's you know really quite powerful um so the, the pandemic hits um people don't want to buy t-shirts these guys are like let's make some masks at the time um, a chinese mask which is mostly what we were buying was three cents which as Lori will again be able to tell us better than anyone is dumping because the materials are five or six cents at least and that's before inflation an american mask was 30 cents during the course of the pandemic, that price differential got down to 10 cents. So you've got an American mass that's 10 cents, a Chinese that's three. But if you tally in the true labor standards, the true environmental standards, do you want a product made by tiny fingers in Xinjiang? Or do you want a product made by someone who's actually being paid a living wage um, in, you know, with, um, and, and making things in ways that are not going to kill the planet? Then that and, and fuel, the fuel divide, so you don't have the transport costs, that starts to narrow. So this sense of regionalism for all kinds of reasons, when cheap really isn't cheap, makes a lot of sense. We can come back to that, but let me go to whiny Europeans because that's always fun. Um, I think what's happening is 
Europe is, and this was the same thing in the, the wake of the 2008 crisis, is grappling with the flaws in its own political economy, okay? It always wanted the upside of integration without the downside, which is essentially wealth transfers. I mean, the US, you know, California sends money to other states, you know, we, we have um, a, a unified system. The Europeans, you know, really don't have that still. They've made some progress in integrating economically, but they don't, you know, there, there's no single tax policy. There's not really not even a single kind of banking standard um, within Europe. So they're separated. And I think one reason that they're feeling particularly whiny and, and within that fearful is that they don't know how they're gonna land in this new world. You've got certain countries in the South of Europe, Italy and, and, and Greece in particular, that are already kind of being pulled into the China one belt, one road you know, pathway. You've got Germany, which was hugely dependent, is hugely dependent actually on, on Chinese exports um, and Russian gas. I mean, what a, what a Faustian bargain. Um, and is now just like, oh my God, we've got to get out of this, but it takes time. And um, right now the priority is energy, but there's, you know, China and exports and how do we, you know, what we still want to imagine ourselves as the world beater in this particular, you know, industry or that industry. Do we want to work with our American partners? And so I think there's a lot of soul searching going on about, you know, are we unified? And if we're not unified, are we going to be part of a transatlantic alliance? Um, I don't think they figured it out and then throw in Brexit and you get a lot more pain. So. That's what I think is going on. So just to, to I, we can talk more about whiny Europeans, but just to- Yeah, I'm curious what you guys think. Do you guys agree with that or do you have a different analysis? Uh, Matt, you want to dive in? Because I want to I want to dig back into the book, but Matt probably has a view about this. Matt has a view about many things and they're generally very smart. I mean, well, what I think you're seeing every everyone is wrestling with this problem where they know that the existing model of of um of risk management doesn't uh is dangerous and corporate america has not decoupled from china right yeah so like there's a sort of sense that america is like willing to do it but we actually haven't done it and i think Lori can you know a lot of the ppe industry that we brought back during covid has since yes gotten re offshored to china so it's like the rhetoric here is, you know, and we we did some fancy stuff with chips. The rhetoric here is better, I guess, more overt than what's happening in Europe. But the indecisiveness, the unwillingness to pay anything really to transition is, I think, it, it, you know, in common. But I think that the Europeans have a, a an additional problem because they get free defense from the U.S. and they don't want to admit it. A hundred percent. Yeah. So they're like addicts. And they also think they're better than we are, um, which I don't really know why, but because they're there's not. a lot of there is a lot of virtue signaling in Europe. I will I will say I know they keep throwing stuff on oil paintings. Really weird, but like um, it it's it's just a it's it's a but the structural problems are very similar to the ones in the U.S. I mean, oh yeah, so yeah. I, I you know they they they're dealing with the same market power issues and the same energy. You know, the, it's very similar. It's not the same, but it's it's very similar. They're just a little bit more annoying. I think there's also, though, an element that there's like a sort of strange rhetorical ideological thing that's specific to Europe, where in the U.S., when we talk about populism, we have a progressive version of it and the history of it. And we have, you know, people like my state of Wisconsin's fighting Bob LaFollette. And the idea of populism is basically an economics yeah. that is aimed at supporting the most of the population and having right. the political economy be our government does what we need for most people, it's not captured. Versus this idea of populism or the idea of even thinking as a nation, as a region almost, <laughs> is there's a, you know, there's a history there that makes it very awkward. And so that leaves a vacuum, I think, psychologically. And I've noticed this in decades of working in Europe where that huh. very smart people who understand the policies of neoliberalism have failed are very nervous about talking about some of the instrumentalities you need to break up that behemoth because it sounds kind of nationalistic. It sounds well, I think you they're afraid of democracy. Well, well, that's it. 
That's interesting. Well, you know, Quinn Slobodan would, uh, Slobodian, I think would, would, would argue some of that. Um, Lori, you just hit something. You connected a couple dots that I sort of look at in my book, but I hadn't connected them in quite that way. That this fear, which I, I do encounter this, it's funny as an American writing for a European publication, I have to watch the language that I use because I agree I'm familiar with a populism that is essentially about the populace um, and is not about nationalism or fascism. But in Europe, I think you're right that these ideas evoke the 30s. And the 30s, understandably, make everybody really nervous. And interestingly, the 30s were also the point at which the neoliberal model was born. Um, you know, we often think of the Reagan Thatcher revolution, but actually it came out of Europe. It came out of, you know, Mont Pelerin and, and, and a lot of the ideas that were really about, okay, God, we've got this, we were between two wars, things are chaotic. How do we prevent countries from going to war with one another? And so this idea to tampen down national politics, basically, you could say the state, but in some ways I agree with Matt that you're, you're, you're tampening down the local politics by connecting business and capital strongly across borders was, was really the foundations of, of this theory. And it's interesting because, you know, every, I think every economic theory, if you go back in time, it's kind of, it can be appropriate for its era until it's not, you know, pendulums swing and you can see why this idea came to Europe at that time. Mercantilism, you know, in the 18th century made sense for a little while, then laissez-faire, then Keynesianism, now neoliberalism. And, but by the 90s and certainly by the last 20 years, you're just, you know, the, the pendulum has so wildly swung to a direction in which ironically nationalism and, and really extreme politics, call them fascist, call them whatever, what you will, you know, have been the result, which is exactly what the model didn't want. The opposite outcome. Well, the opposite. That, that, a little bit of that is sort of the other piece of the, what you describe and what you explored as some of the, 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 sort of more resilient, prosperous, place-based economics you talk about yeah. of a future that is the post-globalization future. And I guess I'd love to hear a little bit more of how, sort of what the process was of concluding that is the direction things can go. Some of the examples that inspired you to think that, and particularly, and this is sort of the, the grimmer part, in the context of these constructs, Yeah that are built into the global economy, like, you know, like those neoliberal, ne neoliberalists weren't horsing around. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> cement, they cemented in like, you know, hi, here are the handcuffs. They are made of shit you can't cut and we're throwing away the key. <laughs> and so there's a lot of that that is still there of structures that have governments, you know, a lot of the things that the Europeans are doing, the Chinese are doing and the Americans are doing are actually against the rules of things like the IMF, the WTO. It's just the yeah. less powerful countries that have had to follow the damn rules or else. Yeah. Now suddenly the countries that impose those rules and everyone else are going, ah, uh, this is not working out. So yeah. how how is that optimistic view? And also, you know, new 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 factors about, well, just what basically venture capital is doing. There's a lot of worrisome things going on. How do you get to that optimistic view? Yeah. Okay. So I don't want to discount the fact that there's a lot of headwinds, no doubt. I mean, and just, you know, to, to, to your point, when you look, and I do look in the book, there's really a fantastic UNCTAD, UN um, uh, Trade and Development Group report, um, about the big, they, they, they did a really precise measurement of, look, who benefited economically in the last half century from globalization? And the two biggest entities were the Chinese state and multinational corporations. That was the bargain, cheap capital for cheap labor. That's why you have, you know, economists like Larry Summers, for example, will point to, you know, oh, everybody got wealthier, 1.3 billion people lifted out of poverty. Right, true, but, within almost every country, a huge wealth gap emerged because the bulk of that um, capital went to those two entities. That's why just, you know, one stat that always kind of blows my mind when you think about that Wall Street, Main Street divide in the US is that 85% of stock is owned by the top 10% of the population. 
So when you think about what our economy, what that neoliberal model has done, it's basically all about pushing up asset prices, which makes, you know, frankly, people like me that own a house or have stock wealthier and people that um, are less asset rich and are making their money from a paycheck poorer because wages have stagnated for all Americans since the early 90s and for working people really, you know, depending on the group, even, you know, working men in particular, you know, since the 70s. So um, not a good bargain. But the optimism is this, even though we've seen these extremes at a global level, and if you, you know, if you go um, into certain parts of the country, you can, particularly coastal areas, you you can really see those extremes playing out. There's plenty of areas that just aren't like that. And a lot of them are in places like where you and I grew up. So even though, you know, my town was hit hard, there are other places like Kansas City, for example, you know, that has um, just a much more diverse economy. And so one of the things I started looking at were what are the characteristics of places where there is a a broader based shared prosperity? And they tend to have much, much, much more mixed development economically. Not everybody is a banker or a software developer. There's there's a mix um, of manufacturing, of services, of education. There tends to be, and this is interestingly, particularly in the Midwest, there's a little bit of adoption of that Germanic model, you know, perhaps it's cultural where you have, even in the wake of, um, I think Democrats mistakenly given up, giving up on vocational programs. I think that was a terrible mistake. Um, that was sort of a, oh, we don't wanna be classist. Well, you know, better to be a plumber and make a couple hundred you know, thousand dollars in New York. That was actually something that. I didn't know about. You put that, the, the Democrats got rid of vocational programs in the late seventies. I didn't know that. Yeah, they, there was a, it was a class issue. They didn't want their, and I, I get it in a theoretical standpoint. People didn't want there to be um, what, you know, a Germanic, like you're a tradesman from grade three, you get to go to the great, you know, the grand Ecole if you're French, you know, like that, that kind of thing. Um, we were going to be equal, but the bottom line, and I've written a lot about this too, is that the lower um, quarter of the population socioeconomically has taken on huge crushing debt burdens, trying to get up this four year college ladder, often having to work um, part time while being in school, leading to higher dropout rates, often going to second tier or third tier universities where the degree isn't necessarily worth as much in the marketplace, where frankly, a degree is a credential as much as it is about, um, you know, what you're actually learning often. Um, So so that that whole model was flawed. Um, but in the Midwest and in, you know, not only the Midwest, but, uh, you know, certain parts of the country that are a little more balanced economically, there have been some relationships that have still been maintained between educators, um, uh, job creators. Columbus, Ohio is kind of the gold standard of this. Um, you know, that's a city that was really crushed after the financial crisis. Um, and they had, if I remember correctly, a, a three term Democratic mayor and but a mostly republican business community and they were kind of at a point they'd like cut everything they were down to collecting trash once every couple weeks or you know it was bad and they're like all right are we going to be an also ran rust belt city are we going to kind of wither away or are we going to do something new and they came together and they're like how can we connect the dots we've got all these community colleges we've got industry we've got some services we've got a little bit of finance there was a nice balance And they decided to do a tax hike, the first in 32 years, but some of the business leaders were allowed to sit on a civic council and talk about the ways in which the money could be used to bring in talent. So they made some decisions about building infrastructure, um, bolstering um, trade programs, and these kind of like, they're called um, Fraunhofer Institutes, I believe. They're like, it's a German word where you actually learn and kind of upskill the trades um, and business and and, and educators work together on this, bolstered those. And then they did some some renovation of the downtown as well to bring in some knowledge workers from the coast. They now have the third highest level of um, designers, industrial designers, you know, commercial designers in the country after New York and LA. And they've created the, I think over half of all the jobs in Ohio since that time. So now they were they had a good mix. They had a lot of advantages going in. But what I'm trying to sketch here is this is what a balanced economy looks like. You have to have some production and consumption hub together. You have to have a mix of industries. You have to have enough middle class jobs that people can earn enough to actually keep 
consuming, you know, this idea that, you know, you can have a 70% consumer economy in this country, but you don't give anybody a raise for 40 years. is just like, what, you know, I'll stop now. I just keep going. How does that scale up? Because folks, when you read the book, what's very interesting is Rana visits a couple of different places that most of us don't know are, you know, there, which is to say some of these examples of places that have hit rock bottom because of this model of globalization, and then have had inter- or have one way or another dodge being flattened by it. And there's typically features that are somewhat specific to these places, but are lessons that could be scalable. Yeah. So how, how does, you know, how does the things that you found as you were looking for alternatives, how does that scale up? Does it scale up? You know, there's not a silver bullet, but there are so many factors that I think can be leveraged by different kinds of communities. Let me lay out two or three of examples, and there's many. Um, so, you know, I, I mentioned the the example of the textile industry where, you know, yeah, the Carolinas were pretty hollowed out. On the other hand, you had a lot of family run businesses that were really committed to the community and were willing to start to continue the what used to be the gold standard of business, which is put as much of your profit back into productive capex. And that includes worker training, that includes investing in factories, that includes like stuff on the ground. Don't go buy back your own shares, um, like do stuff that's actually going to grow the seed corn of the future. And so they had those kinds of companies. Um, they were able to work together and, you know, really kind of survive as a regionalized network of businesses. That's something that I could imagine linking up with federal industrial policy around, say, electric vehicles. You know, you've got some um, EV subsidies happening in South Carolina. Well, these textile makers could very easily, and in fact, are starting to do upholstery for electric vehicles. They could do covers for wind turbines. I mean, this is This is not, you know, heavy industrial policy. This is just like basic dot connection. Like you and I could go down there with a pencil and paper and figure this out. Um, But there are other things that technology is actually a phenomenal tailwind to localization right now. So additive manufacturing, which is, you know, otherwise known as 3D printing, uh, used to be for hobbyists, you know, um, you know, something you did in your garage. In the last 10 years, it has not been that. It's really started taking off. And COVID was a tipping point because suddenly this was a way that you could actually get stuff that you couldn't get any other way. So you could 3D print um, a respirator part and fill a need. Um, You can actually now 3D print entire products like a car or in fact a house. And one of the um, really super cool success stories that I look at in the book is uh, a company called Icon. It's an Austin-based company. It's run by a um, really interesting guy, Jason Ballard, who um, his, his parents were um, uh, oil rig workers. And he became concerned at, in South Texas, he became concerned about the environment and then realized that, wow, supply chain, it's not the oil industry that is the biggest problem with the environment, it's su- long supply chains, and in particular, in housing which actually has seven different global supply chains, each coming in totally different ways with their own carbon footprint, with their own energy footprint, with their own input costs. Ever wonder why housing prices are so high right now? Put aside what was happening with interest rate hikes in the last year, supply chain issues. I mean, I know people who are hotel developers that were literally airlifting stuff from Latin America, like because you cannot get the supply chains online. They're so crazy and far flung. So he thought, well, let me think of a technological solution for that. And so he started working on 3D printing techniques and he actually started manufacturing shelters for um, disaster relief. So if you if there's a tsunami and you need shelter for aid workers or for people that have been um, made homeless quickly, you can 3D print a shelter you know, in the course of a day. So then once he ramped that up, he started thinking, how can I commercialize this? And he worked on more techniques and he's now in Austin. You can go and like buy one of these houses, 3D printing in six days, $250,000 homes that are super cool. You, they're like very like mid-century modern poured concrete kind of vibe. And there's a solution to some of our housing shortage and it's hyper local. And what's really interesting is it's technology that is both hyper local and fueling a local ecosystem, but can also be 
sold and exported, you know, and sent to Africa where, you know, you can use them to make shelters or do whatever is necessary for the local ecosystem. Now, where did that technology come from? Uh, Silicon Valley. So did, wasn't it financed by, what didn't it MIT and- Oh and God, it, yeah. Well, oh yes. Oh, you mean before Silicon Valley? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait. I was trying to set you up for some- The government? <laughs> <laughs> There, there we go. I missed my, wait, that was like the thing where you throw, yeah, I totally missed that pivot. That was I'm like sorry. a, you, you missed the sorry. layup on that one. Actually, you know, a cooler, can I just tell like a cool, what a super cool story from the book. I just love this story. Um, thinking about hyper decentralization and actually maybe coming back to geopolitics for a minute. Um, one of the women, really interesting women that I met in the course of my research is this uh, lady, Molly John, who is heading up DARPA's newest program. It's one of these kind of fully funded, like go fix food systems program. Like that's your, you know, that's your job. And DARPA is, as everybody knows, that's the innovation arm of the defense department. This is like the place where you're, when you're super genius and you know, you want to blue sky it, you go. And if you don't invent the internet, you get a B, but um, <laughs> if you do, you get an A. Um, so she went in as she had been a plant biologist, actually in Wisconsin, you'll be, you'll be um, happy to know, Lori, and was thinking about food systems and how basically how screwed up big ag is and our entire system of industrial farming, which is something that I think we all came to realize during COVID, you know, pandemic hits, restaurants are empty, grocery stores have lines, you can't find stuff in them. Why are the two not talking? Because they're run by like four companies and they have these efficient, efficient supply chains that don't talk to one another. And as we all know, industrial agriculture, huge designed to push cash crops out there, um, very toxic for the environment, not great for workers, You know, not great treatment. We saw that with meatpacking plants. So she's looking at these food systems and also energy security systems and thinking, whoa, we have the makings of a disaster here because not only is, is just what's happening in, in our own country in terms of food security dangerous, um, if one thing goes wrong, if there's a climate disaster, if there's, um, you know, um, uh, you know a, a, I mean, any, any number of things, a, a pandemic, you get food security issues, but then look at the way China is approaching this, buying up Portland, um, securing a lot of commodity supply, really kind of trying to ring fence some of this as part of a larger strategic game. And she thought, gosh, this is dangerous. Um, we need to figure out a new way. And so she is actually trying to invent hyper decentralized food production systems, which I kid you not, if you've ever watched Star Trek, are literally like the thing that you say, I want a shake now. And you push it in this na, 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 and it comes up. She has figured out a way for the, and it's going to be trialed in the military for um, soldiers with nothing but a um, backpack generator to land in any given area. And as long as they have access to um, air and water and that electricity source, they can make a nutritional um, mix essentially from, uh, from a microbial stew that can be created in that way. And her, her job now is to turn that into a little gizmo that we can all have at some point in our house um, to make something to eat if we have any kind of a global incident in our food supply, which I think is like the ultimate in localization. The, the, in a lot of these stories, there's technology. A lot yeah. of it, Matt was pointing out, government originally funded yeah. technologies like our vaccines that a couple of country, companies are monopolizing and profiting, but government funded. But putting that aside, tell us where the people are in this, because part of the question I think that <coughs> as um, is a linchpin to sort of the future of our democracy and around the world, is the thing you talked about, which is people feeling secure, the feelings of community, the place-based nature of everyone having some role, more equity. And before we turn and folks start sending questions to the Q&A, if you have been put in there, please send some more. We're going to turn to you next. But I'm wondering, in some of these scenarios that you're describing, there's some amazing tech, but what is the role for people to have livelihoods and incomes and financial security? Well, a few different ways. Um, 
I'll use another example. You know, I looked at um, vertical farming, which is a high, highly decentralized way of farming. You basically grow pro crops up buildings and um, no chemicals involved, just a lot of very specialized light and, and water. Um, a company like that, that does farming that way is going to be able to pay workers and grow a higher quality of middle-class jobs than say a traditional farming operation that has essentially a few people at the very top and then some terribly paid <coughs> workers at the bottom. And, um, and I actually looked at this, I looked at a company called Plenty, it's one of many doing this, but they, they're creating a kind of a um, rather than a race to the bottom, a race to the top in terms of innovation, because as they work on these new paradigms, they have to develop things and they call on other local businesses to help them develop. So Plenty, for example, when they were developing these vertical farms, we, were like, we don't know how to make these light. We, we need special lights. We need special plastics. Well, they went to industrial designers in Detroit for those. And so there's a kind of a again, a, a virtuous cycle of, of upskilling that I think doesn't happen when you have a handful of highly globalized companies that are simply trying to go for cheap, 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 get cost off the balance sheet. The other thing I would say, excuse me, <coughs> this is the risk of being on book tour, you start to lose your voice, um, is that we haven't talked, we talked a lot about manufacturing, we haven't talked a lot about the service economy yet and the care economy. The care economy, which if you look at the top 10 fastest growing job categories in the US, more than half of them are in some kind of care, healthcare, education, um, childcare. These jobs are by proxy local. And demographically, this is gonna be where the growth is. The opportunity, of course, is to make sure that they don't become a race to the bottom. And this goes to a question that you'd asked that I kind of left hanging where's finance in all this? And I'm a little worried, I got to say, because you're starting to see private equity in particular, you know, which is, just, I mean, the raping and pillaging, it's just never ends. Um, private equity firms, you know, in the wake of that 2008 crisis, they bought up all the houses on the courthouse steps, flipped them, rents went up, people, you know, um, ended up paying higher than average rents in areas that had high unemployment, just a disaster story. They're buying trailer parks now, if you can believe it, and you know, kicking people out and raising the rents. They're now starting to eye the industrial space and the care space. So I'm very worried that Eileen Applebaum has done um, at, um, oh gosh, which organization? The policy Institute. Yeah, at, yeah, yeah, at EPI. She's done some great work on, on how there's consolidation now in all kinds of care industries. You know, they took the low hanging fruit first, dermatology, sports medicine, but now they're going for nursing homes. Now think about what a neoliberal optimization of a nursing home looks like. You know what that looks like? That, that's, that's about hiring the bereavement or sorry, firing the bereavement expert with like 20 years of experience that's helping you get through your grandmother's death and replacing him or her with someone who's making, you know, God knows what, probably below minimum wage if they can get away with it, um, you know, to do the laundry. And that's what healthcare is going to look like if we if we don't get it right. Now, obviously, the Biden administration is trying to do some things to upskill the care sector. Um, Heather Boucher has been working really hard on that. Um, but there's a lot more that could be done. And I'm also worried about uh, private equity going into middle market industry because as I said, this is an area where I think there's a lot of hidden strength in this country. And it's hidden because it's been private. You know, it hasn't it hasn't been under the pressure, under the thumb of Wall Street, but a lot of great um, mid-sized private family owned businesses in this company that are best in breed, making whatever they make. And private equity is now saying, OK, in this age of localization, let's get those companies. Let's consolidate those companies. And. I really hope, I wish, my wish would be that the SEC would look very carefully at this and use whatever power possible to, to limit, particularly at this moment when we need these companies, um, you know, this kind of race to the bottom. Well, and this is one, this is putting a couple of the questions that have come in together. And Matt, this is one of your areas of expertise as well, which is more or less people are asking, um, how, do, how is it best to address 
monopsonies, monopolies, concentration of corporate power. We're not talking about concentration of finance in basically making possible this more diversified, resilient, frankly, redundant, focused redundant, on, yes, yes. Focused on things like you know, secured supply chains, resilience, equity, not efficiency. How which, you know, as you've pointed out, isn't actually been efficient. But yeah. Yeah. how how is that how do we break up that power? This is for you, Matt, I think. Well, I mean, you you had a bunch of stuff in your book about it. Um, you do. But if you, I can talk, but oh, I thought you were. I'm sorry, I didn't want. To, I felt like I was monopolizing the conversation, and I didn't. You're you the also author. wrote a book called Goliath that was kind of about this. But I just want to give you some props. You know, give you a little, give you a little support. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, and yeah. by the way, you can order at bookshop.org. The support of the <laughs> local bookstores, both Homecoming. <laughs> And Goliath, they're a great <laughs> companion set. We should Please. have had a two for one deal or something. I don't know, that that would have been good. Um, well, obviously what we need to do is to not only enforce existing antitrust policy, but I would argue think differently about antitrust policy. I mean, I, I, I know Matt agrees with this power, power, not pricing. You know, I mean, this this idea that consumer prices, and, and, and this is a point I actually dug into in my second book, which was about big tech and, and monopoly power and big tech, the idea of price as a metric for what is good for the consumer, it doesn't even fit anymore in a world of big data in which transactions are essentially barter transactions, where there is no understanding of price. And this is, a, I think, quite profound thing that people need to understand in terms of how broken the cap, the ca our capitalism, not even just like markets, but our capitalism is, you know, Adam Smith would have said you needed three things for a functioning market. You need equal access to information, um, a shared understanding of what the transaction is, and a shared moral framework. None of those things are in effect when I'm buying something on Amazon. And none of those things are in effect when we are thinking about trade between the US and China, frankly, you know, I mean, there's, this is the core of the problem that we thought there was going to be this one size fits all solution in a highly complex global system. And, you know, we're not in the 18th century marketplace here. There's a lot of different value systems flying around out there, both at a country level and at a corporate level. And, you know, we, we have to think about that when we're, when we're making the rules. Matt, anything to add? I mean, it, it's, we're going to have to return. Well, there's a lot of things, but you know, you, you have to do it sector by sector. Someone mentioned um, the parity system in agriculture, which is a good, it's a good model for that, you know, that sector. But yeah, I mean, you talked a lot about, um, well, there are regulated sectors, you know, where you, there, you might need to regulate Google like a public utility, whereas maybe you can break up Amazon. Um, but it's just, it's about it. You put it out. It's about focusing on power. Uh, and making sure that the power over over our economy rests in the hands of democratic government and not in these private unaccountable actors. A hundred percent. I have to say the 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 I'm one area I'm thinking about a lot is space and monopoly corporate not monopolies in space and and even just the weird way and you saw this in you know with with Elon Musk and Starlink in Ukraine I mean on the one hand it's kind of great that you know he kept the internet up there and, you know but on the other hand it's like whoa okay do we want actually you know two guys controlling space <laughs> that that worries me yeah the space um, a lot of space industry is getting uh, rolled up right now it's a pretty um it's something that we need to pay much closer attention to. And translation rolled up meaning monopolized, purchased stock, put into one right. big glob. Right. Um, I have learned my corporate concentration lingo. So we're, we're running up on time. I just wanted to give Rana one last chance. If there's anything else you wanted to add, well, I make one more pitch for folks who really want a accessible, but very well researched and documented description of not just the problem, but some really interesting ideas about a way forward that isn't sort of the dystopian nightmare we're all scared of. 
that, um, you know, also lays out there's a lot of work to do to get the structures in place to get the outcomes, to nurture the good things that Rhonda found in thinking about and working on this book. It's not a done deal, but there's hope for it. What are your sort of closing words that will inspire everyone to go to bookshop.org and get um, the double deal, Homecoming and <laughs> Goliath? You know, um, I think that there's just a lot to be optimistic about. I really do. I mean, it's, listen, it's a struggle and we're all in the struggle and I'm really appreciative of just looking at all these awesome questions. Um, and if anybody wants to ping me, you know, my email's everywhere, feel free to reach out. Um, I just think this country still has a lot going for it and we forget that sometimes, but we have the building blocks here we have food. I mean, we are incredibly blessed. We have food, fuel, consumer demand. I mean, this, you know, in the global picture, it, it's, it's a pretty good setup, but we have to stop tearing each other apart. We have to look at the, the economic good uh, of the community and we have to kind of tune into our felt experience. You know, I mean, do we really want to turn over power to, um, as you say, a, a handful of, of unelected corporate um, overlords? No, I don't think so. And I think the millennials get that. I'm actually really um, jazzed about the way a younger generation is thinking about these questions. Rana Faruhar, thank you very much. And my, to my colleague, Matt Stoller as well. Thank you everyone who joined tonight and for all your excellent questions and for participating in the conversation. This is another session of Thinking Big the American Economic Liberty Project's virtual book club, where we have cutting edge ideas and books and their amazing authors. So with great appreciation to Rana for writing this book and for spending the hour with all of us, please stay tuned for the next edition of Thinking Big. And thank you all very, very much. Make sure you actually go get the book, read it and get engaged. Thank you all.